and uh, Weapons of Reason won uh, Best Use of Illustration in 2017, uh, and they'd actually won it in 2015, so this is the first time that any mag has won the same category twice. Uh, and Paul Willoughby is the art director of the magazine, um, and he does just a beautiful job with commissioning um, illustrators and working with illustrators, um, with everything underpinned by this fantastic sense of simplicity to tell the stories in the magazine. So, um, Paul, come and tell us about simplicity. Organize myself. Um, hello, Moonhen. Um, thanks for having me. Um, yeah, as Steve said, I'm going to talk a little bit about simplicity today around um, the brands. I run a, an agency called Human After All. Uh, we make this magazine called Weapons of Reason, uh, and that's obviously my name at the bottom there. Um, so, simplicity isn't really the word you think of when faced with a screwed up piece of paper. But this is kind of what I was drawing as, as a, a young art student. So I'd sit there as a 14-year-old art student. I'd come to um, school every day, and I'd work on my screwed-up piece of paper drawing until it was a, a photorealistic screwed-up piece of paper. Um, and that was because my art teacher was always sick. He was never there, so we were just left to our own devices. And this is what a bored art student did. Uh, until one day, my ceramics teacher came in and placed this stinky fish in front of me. Um, and he said, draw it. You've got 30 seconds. So I scribbled away. Um, and then he said, you've got 15 seconds. So I scribbled even faster. And then he said, you've got five seconds. And I, I had no idea what to do. I'd been drawing this screwed up piece of paper for so long. Um, and what he wanted to do was to completely break my mind and like completely stop me from being in this rut, and it totally worked. Um, what he really wanted me to recognize was like the absolute simplicity of this object and the, 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 um, the shapes that really sort of underpinned it and made it what it was. Um, later on, uh, when I was studying at university, I came across this work by the great master Hokusai, which really just sort of illustrates the point. You know, he was someone who could look past the surface luster of something into its underpinning geometry. Uh, and this image illustrates that beautifully. Um, so, yeah, I mean, this is the power of great teachers, really. So I'm very thankful for that teacher for completely blowing my mind and making me stop drawing silly things. Um, so if we fast forward to... Um, London, where I, I moved after I graduated. I was really lucky enough to meet um, the founders of Little White Lies magazine uh, and help those guys launch this, this new magazine with sort of illustration as, at, at its creative helm. Uh, and Danny Miller, the, the core founder, put me in charge of the cover of the magazine. Um, obviously, I knew simplicity had to play a certain part. Um, and we also knew illustration was like one of our major strengths. And we all absolutely loved it. So that was going to be a huge part as well. Um, but I guess the main sort of star of the show was this, this illustrated iconic face. So, you know, the human face is one of the most simple, recognizable, iconic things that you can look at, basically. When, when babies are born, they recognize their mother's head shape and their face, like that's the first thing they come across. Um, so yeah, the iconic face became our language, our visual language. Um, obviously, always the same crop, always right in on the face, you know, this sort of um, iconic gaze. There's something about, you know, a cover star looking straight out at you and you looking straight back at it, it's almost hypnotic. And this became the template for every single issue. So just always looking at these sort of the, the pop mystique of these, um, these movie characters. Rewinding all the way back to our first issue, which another sort of visual method going on here was, you know, obviously it's super simple, but we also used the um, complementary colors of blue and 
and uh, orange just to give it that visual bite, just to hook people in, like give them something straight away. Um, we discovered a lot of different principles as we made the magazine. Uh, one of them that became true for us was this, this postage stamp principle. So if you could make your cover so good that it worked well as, as, as the size of a postage stamp, it would be absolutely iconic everywhere else. So we always reduced it down, printed it out, and took a look at things. Uh, we also discovered that um, your cover is the cover that people choose to share. So obviously, you put the cover on your website, and you, it's an immaculate version of it. Um, but once your cover's out into the world, it gets shared by people on social media, and you can't control that, that uh, mechanism at all. So you know, your cover has to somehow weather that storm and be so iconic that it carries well. Um, some other methods we used was um, the underlying geometry of the page. So obviously we bought, you know, I, I, I love the golden section. I'm a big fan of that sort of thing. So we'd overlay that over the face. Uh, there'd also be this strict 12 column grid, but working in both directions. Um, and that's, that really allowed us to find like this, this almost like a bliss point with the facial features of the, the cover star and the, uh, the, the underlying geometry of the page. Um, because when you do things like that, it's almost like people don't immediately perceive what you're doing, but they know that something's going on. Uh, and it really does, does work. Um, for our Tron issue, the simplicity came through with, um, with just pure blue foil blocking with um, black stock. So just really reducing our language down to the absolute bare minimum, uh, which in cold marketing terms meant that we contrasted massively with our competitors, which is obviously great. On the newsstand, we, we just looked totally different, um, which led me to think that uh, Magazine covers are very much like sort of the hi-fi industry from in the last sort of 10 to 20 years. Um, this was a common sight in everyone's house like many years ago. It would pretty much just like scream at you like it was a really obnoxious friend basically. Um, but in contrast to that, we have these beautiful little objects now which just like fit into our lives perfectly, far more human-centered. Um, Again, back to like how we fit in with our competitors. This one says, buy me. This one says, live with me. Like, I'll, I'll live on your coffee table and look nice. You know, I'll live with you. Um, so moving on from Little White Lies, we, we garnered a lot of attention from, from some big brands. Uh, one of them was Google, who invited us uh, for one of the issues that, of the, a book called Think Quarterly that we made for them to make 2,500 unique covers out of um, original art. So it's quite a big, complex ask. Um, what we did was use an East London uh, warehouse to prime a canvas ready for this huge piece of artwork to take place. Obviously, there was a lot of organization behind the scenes, so we had to crunch the numbers, uh, figure out how many covers we had, how many spares we, we needed, um, how big the covers of the book were, uh, which determined the canvas size, and then we worked a half size as well. Um, also, how many characters do we need? Because you know each cover needs at least one character. Uh, and then how many man hours would it take? You know how many humans do we need to get into this space to help churn out this this amazing huge amount of artwork? Uh, and to somehow sort of clarify that the complexity of this ask we had to use some methods. And this one was, you know, everyone uses exactly the same type of pen. Um, everyone works through this, this small little window, which just allows them to make their characters exactly the right size. Um, this is the team just sort of steadily working across the, uh, the canvas, slowly filling all the little gaps as they went. Um, and then came the painstaking process of stitching all of this artwork together removing genitals. Uh, this is a massive piece of the canvas. Like, the actual finished canvas was, complete, was actually twice the height of this. But I mean, I cropped in just so you could, guys could see the level of detail. Um, this is all the covers emerging from the, um, the production line. So obviously, everyone got a completely unique cover uh, with a unique character on from one of the artists. 
Um, so a spectacularly simple, elegant product at the end of a very sort of complex project. And the magic of that journey was revealed to everyone through having this, this poster bundled with the book, which actually showed you exactly um, where your cover fitted it into the whole composition. So after we had worked for Google, um, we, we attracted some more attention, this time from the World Economic Forum. So, you know, obviously a, a organization that deals with highly complex world issues. Um, and they wanted us to bring, so, you know, a sense of human-centered storytelling and warmth to their, their outlook at Global Agenda, which is one of the main print offerings at Davos. Um, so, yeah, we took what was usually quite dry um, infographic approaches and in injected that sort of illustration-led feel and gave it a lot more warmth. Uh, but through doing this magazine, it really sort of pivoted us as an agency, Human After All, into um, focusing on more purpose-driven work, which led to us making uh, our magazine, Weapons of Reason, which, which uh, was talked about earlier. Um, so I guess with Weapons of Reason, we really wanted to know, you know, like how we could use our design skills for good. You know, like we all have design skills, we all do commercial work, how could we do a personal project which really sort of pivoted all that so we could do, do work for good? Um, so this is our first cover, um, Appetite for the Arctic, which you know, really looked at sort of the impact of uh, our hunger for oil in the Arctic you know, and how we sort of doggedly go after it, but you know, representing it in a slightly different, sort of more uh, playful light really just helps these ideas land with people. Um, one of our main mantras for the magazine is everything for a reason. So, you know, as designers, we all have to justify our choices. You know, it's great to sort of sit down and someone to question you as to why you've done something. We do that with each other all the time, from like the editorial all the way through to every tiny detail. Um, and it's really just become like, you know, our habit, every issue to just, you know, really drill down into what's working and what isn't. Because Basically, design is thinking made visual, made visual. So as designers, we can't hide behind our work. Like, our work is just there in front of everyone. So if your thinking's not right, it becomes quite obvious, really. Um, we believe in aesthetic authenticity throughout the whole magazine. That sort of means, you know, the same visual language is, like, as, as strong at the biggest level down to the smallest little detail. So from icons all the way to the big typography. Um, because, you know, like a great sort of visual ident is like a strong lens through which to see the world. Um, and obviously, like the, the design of the magazine is, you know, you can see how constrained it is in terms of the amount of colors and all this sort of thing, etc. use of illustration. Uh, we actually think that creative constraints really drive creativity and make us actually more creative. Um, so in creating all these constraints, we had to make a list of rules that we don't actually follow, which is, you know, we, we ban gradients in the magazine, there's no texture, there's no bitmap imagery, no tints, no frivolous use of color. Um, all the colors must come from the, the work Weapons of Reason palette. Uh, there's no drop shadow or effects or any, any of that sort of thing. Uh, and this is the kind of brief that we send to the illustrators every time they, they, they come on board, is like the sort of rules of the magazine. It just makes their lives a hell of a lot easier. They, they, they don't have to make lots of choices. Um, and also, the heart of the, the brand is the, the brand font. So with the brand font, we really asked ourselves, you know, what is the voice of reason? If the, if the magazine was to talk, who would it sound like? Um, of course, it would sound like David Attenborough. <laughs> um, so, yeah, obviously David Attenborough, his voice is really authoritative in a way, and, and, and we've reflected that in the way this, um, this font is geometric in structure but it also lands softly, you know, it's like he, he simply tells you about the world's problems and you listen because he's not shouting at you, you know, everything's rounded and soft. Um, he always invites you into his world to see for yourself, in other words, use your reason. Also, 
five minutes. Um, also, we have a really sort of strong approach to cover, uh, color. So this is our color system. Um, there's 19 colors that underpin the design of the whole magazine, and there's no way to sort of step outside of those. It just makes our boundaries a hell of a lot easier to control. Um, there's actually a grid of sorts underneath this, this color system. So every CMY, CMYK breakdown either goes in a quarter, a half, or a third of a CMYK K plate. The designers here will, will know what I'm talking about. Um, so it just actually leads to us making much better choices. Um, where we got the inspiration for that, I don't know whether you guys have read uh, Green Eggs and Ham, but what I found amazing about this book is that it only contains 50 words, and that's a real sort of cognitive aid in learning, just having a simplified, you know, creative outlook. Uh, it also allows us to just quickly make decisions, so, you know, and to really get to the heart of each matter. This is the shrinking ice sheet in the Arctic. It's just obvious what's going on because we have such a pure approach to things. Also, with our use of illustration, we love to um, tap into something similar to the, the, this, this um, idea called the gleaming detail, which is something which Irish storytellers talk about. Um, it allows the audience to sort of see this single moment of clarity through, um, through just a simple ju juxtaposition of everyday objects. Um, everyone's seen a match and a picture of the planet before, but once you combine them together, it allows people to just see them in a completely different context and um, really enlivens the mind. Um, yeah, we believe that illustration really makes the ordinary extraordinary. This is like the human impact on the Arctic. Obviously, the, the, the play of symbolism really sort of you know, helps tell the story. This is people living amongst trash, um, seemingly insignificant against the, just the, the, the weight of the problem. Uh, this is suicide in Tokyo. People go to the forests outside of Tokyo to commit suicide. Um, the transience of Blossom really sort of helps tell this story, but in a much lighter, more beautiful way than, you know, just making it sort of graphic. Um, this is about Alzheimer's, you know, losing the chapters of your mind through um, old age. This is the rise of ISIS in Syria. Um, so, like, the black flames burning the city to the ground, basically. Also, we like to use a bit of comedy. As every comedian knows, like, comedy is a great way of um, transferring ideas from, from you to someone else and for people to come along with you on the journey. Uh, this is a 60-year-old drug-fueled sex orgy. Uh, this is older people getting into making startups, you know, beautiful symbols um, combined there. Uh, this is... Um, elderly Chinese people kicking the shit out of uh, millennials. Uh, we also love to see the, like the initial sketches of illustrators. Because we have such a defined language, it's quite good for us just to see like, the, the most simple thumbnail of sketches. And that allows us to see the actual reasoning going on in the minds of the, um, the illustrators. You can see which t turns they took and which choices they made. This was the, that was the initial sketches for Adrian Johnson's um, Arctic cover. Also, this was an a illustration by Jean Julien. You can see how he was, he was making decisions with the knife there. You know, should I add the extra symbol? Should I not? And then he opted to go without for our hunger for energy. We also love patterns. Um, so each issue has a number of like really strong overriding icons in the issue. Uh, this was for the Arctic issue. This was uh, basically fire and ice, water and oil. Um, you get to see the juxtaposition of these, these really strong forces within a tessellation. Uh, this was the rich and the poor for our megacities issue. This was for our aging issue. So it, it looks at life and death and the doctors that sort of influence that space in between. Uh, this was uh, the corporate angels and demons that really sort of you know, um, rule the planet, these big corporations. Um, so, yeah, we've done four issues of Weapons of Reason so far, but we really sort of want to push the simplification route even more. Uh, and that's, this is basically our sort of mantra for the next issue. We want to see how far this simplicity um, rabbit hole goes. So 
Our brief to illustrate is this time is ruthless simplicity. But we'll keep in mind this perfect um, quote from Einstein. Everything should be made as simple as possible, but not simpler. Thank you. I'm going to ask you some questions. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Paul. Uh, the, keeping things as simple as possible, Boris has asked me to remind you that you can ask questions of all the speakers uh, through the whole conference by emailing boris.cohan at edch.de. So that's edch.de. Um, but in the absence of questions, so I, I doubt that we're going to get a question to Boris and up here in time. Um, the thing that I love about what you do with that with your covers, so you, you, mm -hmm. you see the cover of Weapons of Reason, mm -hmm. and it might take a, a minute to, to kind of get it, but then it's got that, that clarity, that message coming straight through it. Yeah. Do you find that something that you can take over into your corporate work, or do, like, because of the beauty of your own magazine is that it's your playground, you can do what yeah, you yeah, want yeah. with it. Yeah. it do you can you can you do that for corporates or does that end up a little bit kind of it's too much? Hmm. Well, we're hoping so. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, like I think the essence of personal work as a company or, or as an individual is to drive your commercial work. So, if you can make your personal work as iconic as you can, then you just attract the right individuals. And you know, through doing Weapons of Reason, we've We've uh, attracted like minds. You know, we've attracted Greenpeace, um, who asked us to do a number of campaigns for them. So, you know, like the right individuals will come and find you as a result of your 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 hard work, and they want the same visual language. They want something in the same spirit. And who's the dream? So you you've had like Google, World Economic Forum, Greenpeace. Who who's the client that you want them to be sitting in the audience now and emailing you after this? <laughs> Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. BMW is quite close, isn't it? Yeah, so, uh, yeah. I'll take BMW if anyone's here. Uh, um, no, I mean, I, I, I probably have to be Apple. Yeah. I just think, you know, Adrian Johnson, who illustrated one of our covers, he's done a lot, some some work for Apple, and um, yeah, just that would be just the ultimate for me. Yeah. Cool. Well, thank you very much. Thank you, Steve. Cheers. Cheers. Okay, we're going to go now from beautiful simplicity to an excess of complexity. I'm sure I think it's the right word. Um, Mold Magazine is a, a mag that we sent out on.